I uh, propose to address the following question. Does biology make sense without Darwin? The answer is yes, and that's pretty much the end of my talk. We can open for questions. <laughs> I call it the evolutionary paradigm. The paradigm is everything that's permissible to believe. It's like a box. Everything inside the box is the whole of reality. Everyone in the box is quite sure. There's nothing outside the box. That's a paradigm. Thinking outside of this box is just simply unthinkable. Anyone thinking of an idea outside this box is not simply wrong. Their views are unthinkable. And there is an evolutionary paradigm, and it goes pretty much like this. I think Julian Huxley spelled it out as well as any have. Our present knowledge indeed forces us to the view that the whole of reality is evolution, a single process of self-transformation. Now, when somebody believes that, that the whole of reality is evolution, that there is nothing else, that everything is just spontaneously self-transforming through natural processes, their best argument for evolution is two words. How else? There isn't any other way. They cannot think of a possibility that would not include just random chance processes. And because of this, we have what is called Dobzhansky's dictum. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. If people really believe this, you couldn't obviously allow uh, a person who uh, did not accept evolution to be a schoolteacher in any of the sciences. Uh, they couldn't be allowed to participate in the allied health or medicine. Uh, they would be closed from careers having anything to do with science. And sadly, there are people that believe that something like this is true, that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Now, I could point to my own career and say, well, I spent about 40 years having a, a brush with science. I had a double major in chemistry and biology uh, in Minnesota way back in 19... But, oh, Got a PhD in cell biology from Brown, and uh, spent a couple of summers Woods Hole Marine Biology Laboratory working on invertebrates, the sea cucumber Thione brararius. That's a heartthrob for you. And a uh, couple of years in research at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and 34 years in the faculty of Washington University School of Medicine. And uh, my students said I made sense of biology. In fact, I received a number of awards for for teaching. And uh, so I uh, take issue with Jabjonski's dictum, but you might say, well, you know, one person and you're a creationist, what would you know? Some evolutionists have come to the same conclusion that evolution really is non-essential, and that was my discovery. In the years that I taught at the medical school, I didn't bother to teach anything about evolution. I mean, at one time or another, I guess I've given a lecture on every organ system in the body with the exception of the pineal. I could never get pumped on the pineal. And I could have saved the last five minutes of the lecture, say a lecture on the kidney, to speculate on how we come to have kidneys before we had kidneys. But if I would have done that, I would have added nothing to my students' knowledge of renal physiology or anatomy. I would have contributed nothing to their ability to practice medicine. In short, it would have been a waste of their time. I never did it, and in 34 years in the faculty, I never had a single student ever complain. No one ever said, you know, we think Dr. Menton gives a decent lecture, it's just that we feel cheated. He never gives us any evolution. Here's an evolutionist commenting on evolution, and I couldn't agree more with this gentleman. He said that while the great majority of biologists would probably agree with Theodosius Dobzhansky's dictum, that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, most can conduct their work quite happily without particular reference to evolutionary ideas. That's an interesting admission uh, from an evolutionist. 
Uh, he went on to say, and I quote, evolution would appear to be the indispensable unifying idea and at the same time a highly superfluous one. I couldn't agree with this person more. Evolution is obviously important to the person whose whole worldview is based on evolution, that everything is coming to being by a process of evolution. I'm sure it's important to them in their minds. But at the level of empirical science, it contributes nothing. I found it possible to not only teach with, but publish papers with people who simply were evolutionists, for the most part, I suspect, agnostics, atheists. And uh, I had no problem interacting, no altercations. Now, if we would have published a paper dealing with how did we come to have livers or kidneys or placentas or whatever, we'd have been in trouble. But as long as we stuck to empirical science, there wasn't a problem. You know, you might think, well, this is the only evolutionist that's ever raised the issue that evolution just might not be all that important, it could be superfluous. But just recently, in an article published in the Boston Globe, October 23 of 2005, Mark Kirshner, uh, who is chairman of systems biology at Harvard Medical School and a very distinguished, well-known evolutionist, Dr. Kirshner said, in fact, over the last hundred years, almost all of biology has proceeded independent of evolution, except evolutionary biology itself. I mean, if you're going to study evolutionary biology, you need evolution. I hope we're not going too fast, are we? No. We think so. <laughs> he went on to say, speaking of his own field, Molecular biology, biochemistry, and physiology have not taken evolution into account at all. Now, to be fair to Dr. Kirshner, he went on then to say that we're going to have to start taking it into account. He wasn't proposing that we ignore it. As a professional evolutionist, he wouldn't. But isn't it interesting? Over the last hundred years, we've had the most incredible breakthroughs in all areas of biology. Think of just molecular genetics, DNA, all of this by itself. And in many other fields of molecular biology and biochemistry and physiology, it has flourished over the last hundred years, and Dr. Kirshner tells us that it really didn't take evolution into account at all. It's useless. It's superfluous. What kinds of questions have they answered with evolution? For example, what about the origin of life? If you can't explain the origin of life, you might as well forget about everything else that follows. Dr. Paul Davies is a physicist. He's the director of the Astrobiological Research Center at Arizona State University. And he's very, very frank in his assessment of what is known. He said, and I quote, how did stupid atoms spontaneously write their own software? And where did that very peculiar form of information needed to get the first living cell up and running come from? Nobody knows. And I would say you could add nobody knows to just about every non-trivial macroevolutionary claim that there is. Where indeed does new information come from? You know, Darwin wasn't even aware that there were such things as information in the cell. Well, the only real source of new genetic information is mutation. You're looking at mutant human cervical carcinoma cells here. They're called HeLa cells. They keep dividing and keep dividing. The person that they were taken from is long since deceased. As far as we know, these cells will keep dividing forever. Normally, cells only divide 15, 20 times, and that's it. It may be part of why we only live to be just so old. Uh, but in cancer, one of the things that can change is the cells can continue to divide, but of course they're highly abnormal at this point. You wouldn't get a cervix out of this, and you certainly wouldn't get a human being uh, out of these cells, but it's mutations that are really the source, if you are to have a source, of fundamentally new genetic information, not just shuffling the deck, but bringing in new genes.